All right, thank you, Rick. I appreciate that. Uh, when I hear those introductions, I just wonder who you're talking about. But I, again, I appreciate it. In the past webinars, uh, we have talked about the capacity situation in Texas, that is in ERCOT, which is about 85% of Texas, uh, the, the decline of coal generation, wind resources, and the solar power opportunity in the state. Uh, today, we're gonna look at the ability to move renewable power from the best production areas to the load centers or to the, uh, the major population centers in the state. In other words, high voltage transmission. On the way, we'll review the power situation in ERCOT, uh, the cost of solar and other technologies, and a few projections about the future of solar and some related matters. This emphasis will be on utility scale solar, not roof type solar, but utility scale solar. So with that, let's uh, just launch into this. First, some basic facts about the ERCOT system. Uh, ERCOT is, is, about, uh, is, a, is a size of about 74,000 megawatts or 74 gigawatts and our all-time peak uh, this year, in fact, our all-time peak forever this year was August 10th, 2015, 70, get right at 70 gigawatts. Um, and our previous peak wasn't, uh, was, was way back in 2011. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Currently, ERCOT has about 12,000 megawatts of wind uh, generation or about just under 16% of the total generation. Uh, about 10,000, just over 10,000 megawatts of that is in West and North Texas and the rest is in South Texas in proximity to the Gulf of Mexico. Typically, we call that coastal wind. We have less than 200 megawatts of solar capacity, but there's another 600 megawatts planned in the next two years, and even with that, it'll only be about 1% of the total generation capability. In ERCOT, the target reserve margin is 13.75%. That is, we wanna have 13.75% extra uh, generation than we forecast at peak, and that's about 9,600 about 9,600 megawatts. Uh, ERCOT is this little uh, pink uh, area down here at the bottom, uh, and it, it's minimally connected to the rest of the US, so it's essentially an electric island. Um, it's about the size electrically as the uh, same size as the United Kingdom or England. And shown here are the approximate locations, these five stars are the approximate locations of all the ties between ERCOT and the rest of the world. Uh, the two top stars are the largest. That's, they, are, they represent about just over 800 megawatts of ties with the Southwest Power Pool or the Eastern Interconnection. The three stars toward the bottom are connections to CFE in Mexico, and they're relatively small. Uh, the total interconnection capability for all five of these is about 1,100 megawatts. Remember now, our peak is about 70,000 megawatts. So it's relatively little. Uh, so Texas or ERCOT has to produce virtually all of the power it consumes and it has to do it instantaneously. As I'm sure all of you know, electricity flows at the speed of light. So when it's, uh, when it's consumed, it has to be produced exactly at that time. Uh, and ERCOT must have the ability to move that power from load or from uh, generation source to load. So it's not good enough to have the power available. You've got to be able to get it uh, to the load. So an electric island. Now, I used 2011 uh, and 2014. First of all, 2014 is the last year we have a full year of data. And 2011 was the hottest uh, year on record. And it gave rise to a number of things. And we'll talk about a little bit of the, about that in a minute. But as shown here are the changes in capacity. Now, this is the ability to generate energy, not the uh, generation of energy itself. We'll talk about that. But it's the ability to generate energy. And so, uh, with the change in capacity between 2011, when we didn't think we had, we were going to have enough capacity out into the future, uh, the change from, from 2011 to 2014 has been about 4,000 megawatts. But the generation mix, as you see, gas to gas, coal to coal, is about the same as it was in 2011. And most new generation projects in the uh, short term, other than wind, will likely be natural gas fueled, uh, as they have been over the last few years because of low natural gas prices, environmental regulations that uh, inhibit the addition of new coal generation, and the uncertainty around the cost of new nuclear power. Solar capacity is included in the little sliver that says hydro, bio, biomass, and others, and is very small, about one-tenth of one percent. Now, in terms of the need to build renewable power in Texas, there's no portfolio standard in Texas for solar. There is a portfolio standard for renewables, and that's 5,880 megawatts by this year. 
uh, with a goal of 10,000 megawatts by 2025, including 500 megawatts of non-wind generation. And we've already achieved those targets. So for all practical purposes, there is no ongoing portfolio standard since we've already uh, met those, those goals. Now, on the energy side, now this is not the capacity to produce energy, it's the energy actually produced. It's somewhat different than the capacity mix. Natural gas generation was 55% of the available capacity in 2014, but only generated 41% of the energy. The reverse was true for coal, only 24% of the capacity, but 36% of the energy. Again, the changes from 2011 to 2014 were small, with coal decreasing a bit, gas increasing a bit, and of course wind increasing as wind's been developed. Wind power represented 14% of capacity, but only 10% of energy, and that's due primarily to the lack of synergy with load and the fact that it's an uncontrollable uh, resource, or largely uncontrollable resource. Uh, ERCOT assigns what I call uh, reliability values to generation technologies. They may call it that as well, but that's what I call it. Controllable uh, technologies such as natural gas, coal, and nuclear have a 100% reliability value because they can be controlled. They can be started up. They can be shut down. Wind and solar have lower reliability value factors as they're dependent on the wind blowing or the sun shining. Wind reliability is considerably greater on the coast, as you can see, 56% than it is uh, inland, the West Texas wind, and that's because the wind patterns on the coast are, uh, are much better and the wind is much more consistent throughout the day than it is in West Texas. Currently, uh, ERCOT counts all solar as completely reliable, 100% reliable, and that's just because there is so little solar. Uh, when solar capacity becomes significant, somewhere in the 500 to 1,000 megawatt range or so in the state, the reliability value will be, a, will be set and it will be lower than 100%, most likely somewhere in the vicinity of 70%. So solar, I believe, will have a much higher uh, reliability value than wind because it's more consistent, especially in West Texas, and it's much more synergistic with load. And we'll talk a little bit more about this in a, in a subsequent slide. Well, ERCOT's a growing market. Uh, we're growing at the rate, uh, and this, this is, these are ERCOT projections, growing at the rate from 2016 to 2025 of about 1.3% per year, or about 1,000 megawatts. And that's due to the good economy that we have, the booming oil and natural gas business, population growth, and, of course, our air conditioning load. And you can see that what, uh, what that load growth per year is equivalent to. We'd have to build a nuclear power plant each year, a couple of coal plants each year, a couple of combined cycle plants each year to, to meet that load, and that's what we're going to have to do. So it's a growing market, rapidly growing market. Now, back in 2011, as I mentioned earlier, we had the hottest year on record, and as a result, we came close to, to uh, hitting our maximum uh, amounts of energy that we could, we could produce. And in other words, reliability was somewhat in question. And so ERCOT thought, well, we, we may not have sufficient capacity. ERCOT produces these uh, what's called capacity demand reserved reports uh, every six months, and this was the December 2012 report. Uh, in this report, ERCOT showed that we would be running out of, or at least below our target reserve margin of 13.75% in as early as 2015 this year, and that by, of course, by 2022, we would be very, very low on, on power. And so as a result of that, the Public Utility Commission began discussions about resource adequacy, which led to a lot of, uh, a lot of different issues, including the, the potential to create a capacity market uh, in ERCOT. However, in the interim, things have changed, and this is the most recent report, and obviously this is a lot different than the December 2012 report. Here it shows that we will, we will not run out of, uh, of power, that is, we will not go below our target reserve margin of 13.75 until 2023, and then only modestly, and probably uh, new generation resources will be added in the interim to, to bring that above 13.75. Uh, so why the, big, why the big change here? Well, primarily this dramatic shift is a result of three things. New capacity was actually built when the Public Utility Commission and others thought that probably it would not be built due to low prices in ERCOT. But there has been new capacity uh, built and there's other new capacity under construction or planned. Uh, increases in capacity value for coastal and West Texas wind uh, contributed to the, to the uh, 
the positive move in this, these numbers. In other words, coastal wind was given a much higher uh, uh, reliability value, uh, my, my term. Uh, coastal wind used to be, uh, the reliability value for coastal wind used to be 8.7%. It is now 56%. And for uh, West Texas wind, uh, it also was was 8.7 percent, uh, but has now been uh, been increased substantially, up to uh, well 12 percent. So half again is as much as it was before. So 56 percent for coastal wind, West Texas wind 12 percent. And the effect of that has been to, for all practical purposes, to add new capacity to the system that was not there before. Uh, so it's clear that there'll be available capacity for some time. Uh, in the future. So that's not uh, a huge issue uh, at this point in time. And we've had a rel relatively warm summer this summer, and it has not been an issue this summer either. Uh, the potential solar capacity uh, in, in ERCOT has been discussed by uh, ERCOT, the ERCOT uh, organization, for some time. And this shows their projection from two th December 2012. And in this projection, uh, this is the December 2012 long-term assessment. They projected that the solar generation potential in 2022 to be just over 2,300 megawatts, 2,300 megawatts, or about 3% of the total, substantially more than one-tenth of 1% 1 today. Uh, that would imply adding an additional 250 megawatts of solar over the next nine years. And while this is reasonably optimistic, the latest assessment is even much more optimistic with regard to solar. And you can see that on the next slide. Uh, this is the 2014 uh, long-term assessment for ERCOT, same organization, uh, same report uh, just two years later. Uh, this uh, assessment shows that 6% of the energy in 2029, in this case, will come from solar. That implies 10, over 10,000 megawatts of solar. Um, and some of the scenarios that ERCOT looked at uh, project that as much as 16,500 megawatts of solar would be uh, in the capacity mix by 2029. And while these projections may seem optimistic, ERCOT reports that as of the end of 2014, 385 megawatts of new solar had interconnection agreements. Interconnection agreements are, the, are an interconnection agreement is the requirement to be to be able to connect to the transmission system and and sell your power. So it's it's an it's an important part of uh, developing any new project. And they had another 600 megawatts of solar projects that they were studying to, to uh, award uh, interconnection agreements. So the direction for solar, even though it's small at this point, is clearly up. Now, a little bit more about solar. Um, this, this chart is just a little bit different. Look, well, I can't get her to the next chart. Rick, can you help me there? Oh, there we go. Okay, I got it. This is another look at the ERCOT projection, and it shows that although 6% of the energy in 2029 is expected to be produced by solar, the rapid upward trend, uh, which is, and it, it's substantial, will not start probably until early next decade. So this shows it to start sometime in the 20, early 2020 uh, decade. After that, in my view, it's likely that solar will take the same path as wind, that wind has followed, that is rapid expansion, almost well, rapid expansion, I guess that's the safest way to, uh, to say that. Now, the, the co a little bit of cost history. This is the Department of Energy and the uh, National Reliable, or National uh, Renewable Energy Lab uh, chart. Uh, and, and cost is a key issue in solar development, as I'm sure all of you know. The Department of Energy's sun, uh, Sunshot Solar PV price goal is six cents per kilowatt hour by 2020. This implies an installed cost of one dollar per watt. And this chart shows that the 2013 solar PV cost of electricity was about 11.2 cents per kilowatt hour, or an installed cost of about $1.80 $1 per watt. And while this, and the cost certainly has declined further, this is the 2023 chart, the latest one I could find with this data. Uh, so it's certainly declined substantially since, uh, since 2013 as well. So the costs are coming down. They're still a little high, but they're coming down. Uh, and here's another look, the capital cost, the cost to build these generation technologies. And you can see here that the, the current uh, estimated capital cost for utility scale uh, solar is competitive with most uh, generation technologies and continues to decrease in cost. Uh, it's unlikely that natural gas combined cycle, wind, coal, solar will decrease substantially. In fact, they have been increasing, uh, w with the exception of wind. Wind has come down some. Uh, but solar PV continues to decrease, uh, and so uh, it is already 
on a on a capital cost basis uh, fairly competitive with uh, with wind, close to natural gas, certainly better than coal uh, and nuclear. And the cost of operation, of course, is much less for for uh, uh, wind uh, for solar and wind than it is for nuclear, coal, or natural gas because it burns no fuel directly. Um, so that that is a key a key factor to think about. Okay. Uh, let's let's talk about uh, the the renewable issues in uh, in Texas a bit in ORCUT. Uh The largest renewable resource developed in Texas is wind. We have more wind power than any other state, and more than about five countries, about twelve thousand megawatts. And this map shows where the key wind zones are in Texas. Now, this chart was part of the competitive renewable energy zones project. Uh, more and more about that later. This map does not include the Gulf Coast as a wind zone, as little coastal wind existed at the time the Competitive Renewable Energy Zone project was initiated. Today, over 10,000 megawatts of wind power is sited in West Texas, another 1,500 or so on the Gulf Coast. And coastal wind is, again, as I mentioned, is much more consistent than West Texas wind, but the potential sites are, are relatively limited. This next chart just shows just real briefly the uh, solar intensity in Texas, and as you might expect, increasing solar in intensity the farther you go uh, west. So it's high, higher in West Texas. Uh, these are the same areas where wind power is being de built, developed, and continues to be developed. So solar intensity and wind are fairly synergistic out there, and we'll talk more about that. This is U.S. solar capacity. It really doesn't directly relate to ERCOT, but I, I thought it was an interesting chart to show that 2014 was another record year for solar PV. There were 6,200 megawatts of new solar PV uh, installed in 2014, uh, representing a 30% increase in, 20, uh, in uh, over 2013. And solar accounted for 32%. This is amazing to me. Solar accounted for 32% of all new electric generation capacity added in 2014, up from 10% in 2012. And it made solar the second largest source of new electric generating capacity behind natural gas. Amazing. Now, this pattern of rapidly increasing solar capacity will likely be followed in ERCOT in the next decade. As I mentioned in a previous slide, that probably will not start until the early 2020s. But when it does, uh, I think you'll see this same kind of uh, of a uh, move up in uh, in ERCOT, as you've seen in the U.S., and the U.S. Uh, will continue to, to develop this way as well. Now, how much, I've covered this before uh, on in a previous presentation, but I think it's just amazing. This is a, a Nash, uh, National Renewable uh, Energy Lab data. Uh, and here the reference is the, the peak load in ERCOT of 70 gigawatts. If we took uh, the, if we added up the urban, uh, rural, and rooftop PV potential for Texas, and I understand earlier I said this was going to be just about uh, utility scale solar and, and, and PV and not rooftop, but in this case we'll add a little rooftop. If, if you add up that potential, it comes to a staggering 20,000 gigawatts. Remember, the peak load in ERCOT, 70 gigawatts. 20,000 gigawatts, or 14% of the total capacity in the U.S. If we could just develop 1% of this resource, just 1%, it would, we could produce over 200 gigawatts or almost three times the current ERCOT maximum load. It's just, it just uh, uh, astonishing to me. So we have a great amount of solar potential uh, in Texas, and I didn't want to let that point, uh, that point go. Now, the transmission. How do we get that power to market, which is the whole purpose for this, uh, this webinar, and I'm sorry it's taken me so long to get this, but I think it's important to establish those basic facts. Well, how do we get the power to market? More specifically, how do we get renewable power, wind, solar, moved from sources in West Texas and the panhandle to the population centers in the state? Now, you notice on this chart, it's a busy chart, but if you'll look, you can, you can make out that the major transmission routes go from west to east, east to west. That is, they go from the uh, corner of New Mexico there, the Midland-Odessa area, to the Dallas-Fort Worth area, uh, upper center. And so it's an east-west the east-west transmission corridor there, and then the two major north-south corridors are from the Dallas-Fort Worth area southeast to the Houston area, and from the Dallas-Fort Worth area southwest to Austin and San Antonio, and then on to Corpus Christi. And so these, this is the way the transmission system has developed over time. It was originally designed to move power from power plants that were remote to these load centers, very mostly gas, coal. Uh, some nuclear power plants to, to the load centers, but it was not designed to move this additional renewable power that's being developed in West Texas. You can see that there's, that the, the, the transmission uh, density in West Texas is much lower than it is uh, in center and eastern Texas. So 
uh, th there weren't very many power plants out in this area. There's not much load out in that area. But so, so now we have the problem of how do you move that power uh, to, to the load centers? So the Texas legislature, uh, the Senate, uh, recognized this problem. And uh, they established the CRES, or Competitive Renewable Energy Zone Program, to construct sufficient new capacity to uh, new, or new capacity and transmission lines to move a total of 18,500 megawatts from the wind zones in West Texas to major cities. Now, in this case, they were not thinking about the coastal uh, wind because coastal wind had not really been developed at this point. So this 18,000 megawatts, 18.5, was to move power from the primarily the uh, uh, West Texas, a little bit from the panhandle over into the load centers, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, 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 Austin, San Antonio, and then on to Houston. Now, the, the CRES program uh, was, a, was a fairly ambitious program. It was planned originally to cost about um, almost $5 billion. It ended up costing about $6.9, almost $7 billion. Uh, and, and the original estimate was about $1.7 million per mile of new, uh, of new uh, transmission, and it ended up costing about $7 billion or about $1.9 million per mile. And the number of projects, and projects weren't just transmission lines, they were substations, they were uh, of, of all various uh, types of equipment that support the transmission system, uh, but there, were, uh, there was an increase in projects of 55%. And to get this done in a relatively short period of time, uh, the, the PUC uh, establish an expedited approval process, and the CRES program, as a result of that, and as a result of the of the uh, of the really diligent construction by the transmission providers in Texas, uh, the, the CRES program is complete. Now, since it is complete, there will still be new transmission that will be needed because there's new load growth, there's new generation assets, um, and it will, but it will have to be approved by ERCOT through their normal means, which will take a little longer. That doesn't mean it won't be approved, but it has to be uh, uh, justified on the basis of reliability and cost effectiveness. One little sidestep here uh, on transmission in Texas, it's a little bit different than it is anywhere else. In any other jurisdiction in the U.S., or at least uh, to my knowledge, any jurisdiction in the U.S. except Texas, if you build a power plant uh, and connect it to the transmission system and it, it, it affects the transmission system somewhere else, now, it, it, you can, when you connect a resource to a system like this, it can cause effects many miles away, hundreds of miles away. It can cause uh, problems, uh, overload problems in the transmission system, simply because of the way electricity flows through these, uh, through these transmission systems. In other jurisdictions, if you cause a problem like that, then you have to pay for the upgrades to fix that problem. Not so in the case of ERCOT. All you have to pay for if you if you develop a new project in Texas is your connection from your plant to the bulk power, the main power transmission system. I will call it the high voltage transmission system. And uh, when when you when you do that, uh, if you have an impact on the system someplace else that re requires an upgrade, you don't have to pay for that. All that is paid for by the load by the people that use electricity on a load ratio share basis. The more load they use, the more of the project they pay for. So, so basically, it's paid for by the customers. Nowhere else is that situation, does that situation occur. And what this does is it makes it more attractive for, uh, for uh, developers to build plants uh, and, and not have to worry about what impact they may have on the transmission system somewhere else. Now, ERCOT knows what those impacts are, and they try to make sure that these, these, uh, uh, these new generation asset, assets are placed in, with respect to the transmission system such that they don't create problems. But Sometimes you can't avoid that, and when that happens, again, it's paid for uh, by all customers. Now, if you look at the CRES, uh, pictorially at the CRES transmission, the, these lines, the lines in, in the blue here are the, are the transmission uh, systems that were built, the new CRES lines that were built, and you can see they extend into south, uh, southwest Texas. They extend up in the panhandle, and they generally move power from those areas over toward Dallas-Fort Worth and then down south toward San Antonio and Austin. You can see the gray dots. One is San Antonio, or the top one is Dallas-Fort Worth, and then Austin and then San Antonio, and clearly the lines move in those, in those directions. And then further on to the right to Houston, there were no lines built directly there, but they're already sufficient, as you saw from one of the previous charts, sufficient lines in that area to move uh, substantial amounts of power. So notice in this case, uh, the, the, the lines extend from west to east for sure, but they also extend from west to southeast, which they didn't uh, before, at least in any volume. So that's the way the 
transmission, the credit transmission systems um, uh, look today. Now, in the, some of the credit transmission lines extend into what's called the McCamey Cres zone. This is this brown area here. It's just one of the wind zones uh, that was that was uh, identified in the Cres projects, and it's an area of high solar intensity. So these lines will also support the transmission of significant solar power. Now that's not to say that somebody might not build solar in some other location in proximity to a Cres line, for instance, farther north up into the Panhandle or farther south. But this is the prime, at least getting into the prime uh, solar zones in Texas, and so there is transmission there built for CRES, for wind, that will support uh, significant uh, solar power. In general, these lines, uh, a typical 345,000 volt line, and most of these lines, or at least many of these lines, uh, CRES lines, are 345,000 volts, uh, and some are 138,000 volts. Uh, but a 345,000-volt a transmission line will carry about 1,000 megawatts, and it's highly dependent upon uh, the conductor size and type, the ambient temperature, the length of the line, and, and other factors as well. But that's a general, uh, general uh, estimate. If you have a double circuit 345,000-volt transmission line, it'll carry about twice that amount, and a lot of these are double circuit 345,000-volt uh, lines. So. Uh, the the uh, CRES does support uh, does go down into the wind areas and support the oper or could support the operation of substantial uh, solar in these uh, in these southwest Texas areas. Now here's just this is a real busy map. I won't stay on it very long, but this shows the existing transmission system with the new CRES line superimposed, and you can see that it's re as as we talked about earlier, it's relatively dense in the eastern part, center and eastern part of the state. Didn't need a lot there. But we did need a lot out west, and that's where the CRES has primarily been built, even up into the Panhandle. So, uh, again, primarily intended to, to ease the movement of wind power from West Texas, 18,500 megawatts total. But they'll, uh, these lines will uh, certainly benefit solar development in West Texas as well. Now. Uh, if you if you look at the uh, project, aircraft's projection that we talked about earlier, that there will be 10,000 megawatts of solar PV in 2029, it could have a significant impact on the peak summer load and reduce the uh, the amount of conventional generation needed. This chart shows a typical summer day and the impact on 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 total load of, of the solar. So you can see the red line at the bottom is solar, the blue line is the total load. But if you add that solar in, the green line is what everything else has to produce. So that's a substantial decrease. Some, you know, again, 10,000 megawatts on peak that does not uh, of some other technology that doesn't have to be built. So uh, you can you can uh, save that amount of uh, of new energy, uh, save that amount of natural gas or coal or nuclear or whatever that burns fuel, and supply it with with uh, solar power. So it's a very, and in 2029, it's going to have a very significant, if, if these projections are correct, will have a very significant impact on the total, the total net load on a summer day in ERCOT. Now, another chart, um, a, a little bit more about why the CRES transmission lines are compatible with solar. Uh, solar power is produced uh, just at the right time relative to load. And you can see that here. You can see the top line is ERCOT load. Uh, the the orange or red, depending on what color you have, the orange or red line is the solar profile uh, with the amounts or with the uh, amount of that to the to the right on the, on the scale to the right, and then the blue line is the wind with scale to the right as well. And these are the the, the numbers, the scale numbers aren't that important. It, the important thing is that the solar profile is much like the uh, ERCOT a load profile, the wind profile is not much like it at all. In fact, to some extent, it's just the opposite. So, so solar power produces energy just at the right time relative to load. Um, and uh, as, as solar power, uh, or I'm sorry, as the sun intensity increases in West Texas, temperatures increase, obviously, air conditioning load increases, but solar PV production increases as well. So it's very, very synergistic with load. Now another look at this uh, from a little bit a little bit different aspect of this. Uh, solar is much more synergistic, but if you combine wind and solar, then you come very close to the system load shape. So the the red is solar, the the blue is is wind, and if you combine those two, you end up with the green line, 
and it's very, very close to the, uh, the profile for system load. And again, the numbers aren't that important, uh, although they, obviously they will be important when we get to this point, but the shape is the important thing. So the synergy of both solar and wind combined uh, is, is really, I think, outstanding compared to the, uh, to the load shape that we typically see on a summer day in ERCOT. And this suggests that, the, that a combination of solar and wind could supply most of the system load when the sun is shining and the wind is blowing. And if you added a rapid start single cycle or even a combined cycle combustion turbine or combustion turbines, you could fill in uh, the gaps that were left and supply additional power if the winds are calm or if the skies are cloudy or both. So where does that leave us? Well, again, I think combining natural gas combined cycle machines with wind and solar could result in a power source that's at least as reliable and available as the current base load capacity, maybe more so. Building a combined resource in West Texas combines the best of all three technologies. It combines plentiful natural gas from new shale production in the Permian Basin. It utilizes the best solar intensity in the state. There's abundant wind and the CREZ transmission, which has already been built and planned to support wind power, will, e will, will serve equally for solar and natural gas generation as well. And so the demand for, in summary, the demand for electricity in Texas is uh, increasing. We saw that about 1.3% a year, substantial new power plants every year, a couple of combined cycle plants, a coal plant or a nuclear plant. Uh, we have a large renewable portfolio, more than all but five countries, uh, 12,000 megawatts of wind and increasing all the time, but we've got less than 200 megawatts, in fact, less than 150 megawatts of utility scale solar PV. But we have an enormous solar PV opportunity. Because of the size of the state and where we're located, probably more solar PV opportunity than anywhere else in the United States. I'm confident that, that is the case. Uh, CREZ transmission supports both wind and solar and will support a combined cycle machine as well or a simple cycle uh, gas-fired machine and does at this point. Uh, solar PV, PV has a higher capacity value, or in, or in my terminology, a higher reliability value than wind, and it's much more synergistic with load. Solar costs are coming down. They're nearing grid parity, and they continue to fall and will continue to fall for some time to come. And so ERCOT provides a unique opportunity to combine solar, wind, and natural gas generation to produce a really an unparalleled uh, power system for this state over the next uh, 10 to 20 years. So uh, I'll stop there. Uh, I thank you for your, for your attention, and uh, I, will, uh, I will entertain any questions that you may have. Great, Ron, thank you so much. We've had questions flooding in. I will uh -oh. uh, remind the audience to please chat any questions you have to all participants or all panelists if you don't want the rest of the audience to see the question. And I'll just start at the top. Uh, so the first question, Ron, was Texas does not provide any incentives for solar. So what will drive the 10,000 megawatts by 2029? Well, again, that's an ERCAT projection. Um, that, that, but that projection does not assume that there will be any uh, renewable portfolio standard for solar. That's just based on the, uh, the economic realities. It is based, of course, on a projection for natural gas price. Uh, it's, it's based on projections for growth uh, in, in uh, energy demand. Uh, and so it, it, what it does is it just includes the, the cost of new generation technologies, the availability of new fuel, the, and, and the cost of, of, of electricity, and very importantly, the cost of new solar. And I think in, their, in, their, um, in some of their projections, maybe the cost of new solar uh, is, not, uh, is not shown to drop quite enough, but, but that's, that's for another day. Uh, but it's just those factors, the, the cost of competing technology, the fact that nuclear, or the, I'm sorry, the fact that solar uh, prices are dropping uh, so rapidly, the potential we've got in the state, the fact that we've got the, the ability to move it to, to, to market, uh, all those are factors in the uh, ERCOT's 2014 long-term uh, assessment that shows the 10,000 megawatt. And again, they have a, if you want to look at this, just Google ERCOT long-term assessment 2014, and you will see a number of scenarios, some of which project as much as 16,500 megawatts 
of solar by 2029, some less, but the but their their the projection I used was their current state. In other words, basically things there's not any major change in the in in the technology beyond what we see we see now. There's not any major change in the legislation. Uh, it's just the uh, sort of the current state that we have now with with gas prices and other other technology prices um, uh, moving up at some at some reasonable rate and. Uh, solar PV moving down. So, uh, and, and again, 10,000 megawatts is a lot, uh, but uh, we will have a, a probably a, a close to 90,000 90, or 100,000 megawatt system by that time. So it'll still be uh, a double digit percentage of the capacity, but not um, probably about 10% of the capacity by that time. All right. Uh, next question was related to your chart on slide 14. The question was, I thought coal was cheap, but your chart shows it much more expensive than solar. Uh, why is Okay, this? let me go back to 14. Well, uh, 14 is a, um, uh, that chart is a capital cost to build a new technology. And uh, coal plants today, um, you could, I, I would accept an argument that says you could build a coal plant for $2,400 a kW. That's what the number is on the side. It's, it's, this one shows $3,000 a kW. I think that's probably more realistic if you were going to build coal, but nobody's building coal. Uh, nuclear is probably even higher than it's shown here. But those numbers are for the capital cost, the dollars per kilowatt to build uh, a new plant uh, today. And natural gas is, again, about just over just over a thousand dollars, about eleven hundred. You could, I would again uh, argue that natural gas could be as low as about nine hundred dollars uh, a kW. If uh, depending on the location, it was built on a on an existing site, so you didn't have to build new transmission or buy any land and that sort of thing. Then it might be a little bit cheaper than this. But these prices are, are uh, I won't say generalizations, but they're I think they're pretty close. Uh, again, I would accept the argument that coal is maybe twenty four, twenty five hundred dollars, but no lower than that. And then coal will be producing how many hours a year? Eight thousand hours a year or so versus two thousand hours of generation for solar. Well, coal. Well, it depends. You know, right now uh, some coal plants are only running uh, in the uh, in the uh, hot part of the year. Let's say from a April through uh, October, and they're they're mothballed the rest of the rest of the year. In general. In general, uh, you can, and this is a generality, and this is my number, so don't attribute it, I won't attribute this to anybody else. The, the general break-even uh, price for coal, that is the, the price uh, below which, uh, for coal fuel below which uh, it is more expensive to produce power uh, with coal than it is with, uh, with gas. Well, let, me, let me back up and say that again. There is a cost of natural gas or a price of natural gas uh, that is that will preclude the operation of coal, and that price is about somewhere between three dollars and three dollars and twenty five cents a million BTU of gas no let me let me describe that so below that, if gas prices are below that it 's actually cheaper to produce power with a combined cycle plant than it is with a coal plant given the current uh, given the current coal prices and transportation prices for coal now that doesn 't include the cost to build the plant that 's just the just the uh, the operating cost, and so right now gas prices are what 270, something like that, substantially below the the uh, uh, the that that break even cost three dollars to 325. So uh, you won't see if that persists, you won't see coal operating uh, uh, 80, uh, every hour of the year. It will operate maybe in the peak periods of the year, uh, maybe half of the year. Uh, right now, a lot of the coal plants are operating all year long, but they will reduce power at certain periods of time. And some coal plants, uh, a couple of thousand megawatts of coal at least in Texas, shuts down completely between, let's say, uh, October and, uh, and April or so. So, uh, again, the, it's, it's all about economics, and uh, you'll see natural gas running more and producing, therefore, more energy, and you'll see coal uh, running less and producing uh, less energy over time. Uh, next question, also on this slide. Uh, I'm wondering why, if solar's capital costs are already competitive, why don't we expect solar to take off in Texas until the 2020s? Also, it's unclear how, if capital costs are now competitive, has grid parity not yet been reached? 
well, or were these the, capital costs shown for projects in the future? Well, these capital costs are, are, are some pretty uh, are some pretty optimistic uh, costs, and I think uh, there there are some solar uh, at least for solar, and I think there are some solar uh, that these costs are pretty close. Uh, this shows to be about eighteen hundred dollars a kW, maybe nineteen hundred dollars a kW for solar PV. I think that's not far uh, off what uh, some is being built uh, for these days. Uh, natural gas is still cheaper. Again, it's cheaper by you know somewhat around fifty percent cheaper. And so, as long as we have abundant natural gas, low gas prices, it's going to it's going to uh, it's going to crowd out solar. And solar again. Uh, and it will for a time. Solar, again, has uh, this uncontrollability factor. In other words, um, it, you, you can't start it up if the sun doesn't shine. You can shut it down, but, and you can't start it up at night. Natural gas plant, you can run it 100% any time, you know, day, light, day night. So, that, so the value, the capacity value of a, uh, of a gas plant is much higher than it is for solar for wind. And so if you're, if you're looking for a contract, to sell your power, you're going to have more difficult, more difficulty selling solar power because you, it's going to be a an as available resource. In other words, I'll sell it to you if I can make it. Well, people when they when they buy power, they're trying to buy power. This is large, uh, large sellers. They're trying to buy power to supply their customers, uh, and and they know what their load shape for their customers uh, is, and they can't afford a situation where they may or may not have the power. So they have to buy, if they buy solar, then they have to buy some gas-fired generation to complement it. And the same is true with wind. They have to buy some other kind of generation that is controllable that will be able to support the uh, the um, uh, solar when the sun doesn't shine and wind when the wind doesn't blow. And, and that's that's expensive. And so uh, this, this, the simple capacity cost is not enough you have to look at the the uh, availability or the or the I'm sorry the uh, the capacity value of the of the uh, of solar. Now, when it gets to, you know with another chart we talked about capacity value down around 70 percent. Well, that's what ERCOT is going to assign uh, as capacity value, I believe, for solar uh, eventually. Uh, but that is a, from a reliability standpoint. Now, the market people that buy and sell electricity will make their own assumptions about how, how much they're willing to pay uh, for, for solar power. So will they pay 70% of what they would pay for gas fire generation? Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, I mean, I, I don't make to make this a long, uh, drawn-out answer, but that, that, uh, that factor that uh, solar is uncontrollable and wind is uncontrollable as well uh, is a huge factor in determining the value of that power to the, to the marketers, to the people that sell power, in the system, and so that's going to inhibit its its uh, growth to some extent. Now, again, eventually, uh, it will be a complement to the rest of the of the generation technologies. In my view, it will never uh, it will never displace the others because it, it again uh, until you get or well at least until we get huge amounts of uh, of reliable and uh, economic storage so that we can produce it during the day, and then uh, and then. Uh, we can store it and then use it at night or use it when the sun doesn't shine. Until we get to that point, uh, there's going to be uh, there's going to be a, a value or a negative uh, aspect assigned to solar and to wind because they're simply not not controllable and they're not an a, they're, they're an as available product. All right. Uh, next question from Michael. I know it's a long way out. However, I'd like to know how you project pricing volatility to impact the value of natural gas facilities over the next 20 years? So I, I guess the question is, uh, what do I think gas prices are going to do? Um, well, it, you know, I don't know, 20 years is a long time, um, but let, let's, let's talk about maybe over the next five or 10 years or so. Uh, I, I think that if, because, you know, 20 years, again, is, is, uh, is way out there, and there's a lot of technology that can happen before then. You know, we had the shale revolution just to, in a short period of time. But I, I think right now that uh, w we're going to see gas prices rise, but only modestly. And the reason for that is because uh, we've, we've really entered a new, uh, I think, a new uh, regime in gas 
production. In the past, if you if gas prices went up and you wanted to produce more gas, you went out and you got a drill rig or maybe built a drill, drill rig and you dug a hole and, and you know took you went down 5,000 feet or however much and and tried to tried to find some gas and that took uh, weeks, months, I guess in some cases years to do that. Today with fracking. With our new technologies, if you want to produce more gas, you just go to an existing well, you refrack it, uh, in not every well is this, this case, but a lot of them are this way. You refrack it, may take a week, and now you're producing more gas. So it's a very different, a uh, very different situation. So it's unlikely, in my view, that over the next five years, maybe even 10 years, that you're going to see gas prices rise dramatically because as they rise, uh, these producers will refract their wells and they'll produce more gas, which will keep the price, keep the price low. So I think, uh, I think gas prices are going to go up, certainly, but I don't think they're going to go up, uh, uh, dramatically. I would be surprised today gas is, what did I say, 270 or so, uh, per million BTU, uh, is the NYMEX price, I think this morning, somewhere in that range. Um, I would be surprised if five years out gas prices were, more than five dollars. Uh, so I mean that's a substantial rise. In fact, I, I think they're probably going to be less than that. But I would be surprised if they're more than five dollars. And that's not a substantial move uh, in terms of gas price in the uh, uh, in, in the based on the history we've seen of natural gas. So anyway, again, this, the short answer is I think there's going to be a uh, an upward slope in the price of natural gas. But I think it's going to be very uh, very uh, uh, modest growth. Uh, next question was, do you see storage as needed and playing a cost competitive role in the near term? If so, which types of storage do you feel have the most potential for being cost competitive to use with renewables? Uh, you answered the first half of that question already. So if you could comment a little bit more about um, what storage could do in the near future to affect the conclusions you had today. Well, uh, you know, storage is, is, you've heard this many times before, the holy grail of renewables, not just for solar but for wind. Uh, so the more storage you have, or the, the, the better off uh, you are. Now, the, the storage technologies we have now uh, are really don't do the trick. You know, we've got some battery storage that's in the double-digit megawatt size, but you're talking about a 70,000 megawatt system here. Um, you'd have to have a lot of those uh, to uh, – uh, to and and you know I guess I guess that's possible a lot of those to to impact the system much at all. Uh, you've got uh, compressed air energy storage, which has been talked about for a long time. It's relatively inefficient, although the newer the newer versions of it are a little bit more efficient. But it really has not taken off. There are only two projects in the world that use compressed air uh, energy storage. And you've got stuff like pump storage, uh, hydro, where you pump water to a hill and let it run down uh, during the day and then it run, I'm sorry, during the night and then let it run down during the day and produce power. So they're really, uh, the, the technologies available for storage, um, especially those that would be contiguous, that is in the general area where you're producing renewable power, uh, are, are limited, very limited at this point. Um, I think one of the, uh, one of the the real potentials is um, uh, distributed uh, storage using lithium-ion batteries, relatively small, uh, maybe neighborhood or even uh, individual home-sized uh, units that would uh, effectively solve or could effectively solve the intermittency problem on a local basis, not on a grid-wise basis, but on a local basis. So if you had a a big enough battery, uh, a lithium-ion battery pack or so that serve, let's say, five or six houses, uh, it may be sufficient to um, to allow those homes to use nothing but uh, uh, renewable uh, power or, or very little other than renewable power uh, and still be able to supply their loads at night. Uh, and after all, at night when uh, solar would produce less power, uh, people are using less power. So it's 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 synergistic with load during the nighttime as well to some extent. So uh, that, that I think is the, is the most likely uh, way that storage will be used in the, um, in the reasonably near term uh, to, to, uh, to, supply, uh, to supply relatively localized um, uh, loads to homes, communities, small 
businesses, let's say, neighborhoods maybe, uh, but not, uh, I, don't, I don't see large 100, 200 megawatt storage uh, scenarios uh, anytime soon in the in the uh, wind production areas, for instance, in West Texas. Now there is a battery, 35 megawatt battery storage facility in West Texas. Um, I'm not sure what the cost was, but I suspect it it uh, uh, it wasn't competitive with uh, with well, it wasn't what you'd need to have in order to build a lot more of that. It was more of a Department of Energy, I think Duke Power. Uh, consortium that built that to just detect, test the technology, and it works fine. It's just limited in terms of how much power it can store and produce, and then how long it can produce that power. So it's you know a few hours, 35 megawatts. Okay, we've had a few questions come in about ERCOT again. Uh, first one is ERCOT likely to continue to increase the reliability factors that they have been attributing to wind going forward? Well, it's possible, but you know the 56% for coastal wind is pretty high, and I, I doubt that they'll they'll do much uh, with that. It's going to depend to some extent on the experience. In other words, if they run into a situation where uh, that uh, that assigning that reliability uh, to or, or reliability capacity value to that uh, technology hurts them because they don't have enough resources available and then therefore it causes a brownout or causes a, at least a, a scare, then they won't, that they will be more likely to lower it. Uh, I, I think it's more likely that the West Texas, that is the inland um, a number may be raised. I don't see it raised a lot, maybe up to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the 20s or so from the 12 where it is now. Uh, but they've moved up substantially from 8.7% to 7, I mean, sorry, to 12 for the inland wind and then from 8.7% to 56% for the coastal wind. I think that's pretty optimistic. So I don't see them uh, moving that um, a lot uh, up in, in, the, in the future, depending on, again, depending on experience. And if they move anything, I think it would be the, uh, the uh, West Texas or the inland uh, the inland wind, panhandle wind. And just as an aside, there's a lot of new wind being built in the panhandle, and some of it outside of ERCOT with the power being transmitted back into ERCOT because some of these CRES lines are not within ERCOT. They're outside of ERCOT, but they're electrically tied to ERCOT and not to the southwest power pool or to the eastern interconnect. And so that area tends to have a little bit better wind than farther south, and so they may, in fact, um, separate wind zones and say, okay, for this wind zone, let's say the Panhandle North uh, will assign a higher uh, reliability value than we will for wind down around the Abilene area, let's say. That's possible. I haven't heard any discussion of that whatsoever or seen anything about that at ERCOT. But, uh, but they look at these things all the time, and they, they are all, always honing their ability, working on their ability to more adequately or more accurately predict what the wind's going to do, when it's going to blow, how much it's going to produce, and the same will be true uh, with solar when solar starts to become a significant resource. Uh, next question on ERCOT was, how does ERCOT account for plant shutdowns or possible uh, fuel supply issues when they assign a 100% reliability factor to gas, coal, and nuclear? Well, I mean, the 100 simple reliability factor is mean, means that when the when the unit is uh, when the unit is is bid into the system, that is, uh, that's the way the ERCOT market works. Uh, the only way your your generation is used is if you bid it into the system uh, the day before. And so, if you bid a uh, thousand megawatts of uh, nuclear power, let's say, into the system uh, day before, uh, they will they will assume that all thousand megawatts of that's going to be available. Now, if you're going to have an outage, then uh, then you don't bid it in. Now, if it's a, it's a, if it's a forced outage, that is, if it's a, an automatic shutdown or some, something beyond uh, what you could predict, well, that's what ERCOT has the 13.75% the uh, reserve margin for. So they have reserves available, uh, both operating reserves and non-operating non reserves all the time uh, the, the higher the load, the more the reserves, the more the uncertainty, the more the reserves. They have reserves available all the time. So if you have a, a large unit, in fact, if you have a couple of large units that for a trip off the line on, with a forced outage, they have sufficient reserves to cover that. And they have a formula that they use for that. And I've, I don't know exactly, or, or well, I, it's hard to describe exactly, but they, 
they can handle the, the loss of significant transmission lines as well as significant generation resources. And this varies, the amount they can handle varies based on what they predict the load to be and the, and the, uh, the atmospheric conditions, the weather conditions to be. Uh, and so they, they will have sufficient uh, generation to take care of that. But again, if it's a planned situation, then they don't, uh, that you wouldn't bid the, the unit into the system. And so the 100% is only if you've said, okay, I'm gonna run my unit tomorrow and uh, I'm gonna run it at 100%, well, they'll, they'll sign it 100%. If you say, I'm gonna run my wind tomorrow and you've got 100 megawatts of wind in West Texas, ERCOT will say, okay, from, for a reli from a reliability standpoint, I'm only gonna count 12% of that or 12 megawatts as being reliable. So I've got to find the other 88 megawatts for reliability somewhere else, gas-fired or some other, some other technology. I hope that's clear. And yes, that helped. And in that situation, uh, if they're they're assigning only 12% to win, if it is a great win day the next day, and say 60% uh, of what was bid in is actually generated, does ERCOT still buy all of that electricity? Uh, well, they buy the wind over the uh, say coal that was being held in reserves. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the, yeah, they, they, they will, or they can if they have the room to do it. But if you, it depends on, on uh, what's been bid into the system and what, uh, you know, the, the, the markets change uh, every 15 minutes. And so it depends on what's been bid in. But if I, let's say I've got a coal plant and I've said, okay, I'm going to sell 100% of my capacity to, uh, to this buyer. Uh, it's called a bilateral transaction. Then if that's the only transaction on the system, and obviously they're, thousands of these kinds of tra transactions, but if that's the only one, then there's no room for the wind to generate. But generally what will happen is the wind will have a contract. Most wind sources and most solar sources will have a contract, an as available contract usually, and uh, and I guess they take all sorts of form forms, but generally in some ways it'll be an as available contract. And so what that says is some buyer has has made the decision that they will buy all of the wind power that that wind generator or all the solar power that that solar generator produces, um, and and they'll just have to account for that somewhere else. So let's say if they produce more wind than they they uh, anticipated, then they'll have to shut down another one or, or or back down another one of their generation resources to make room for it because they've agreed to take all of the generation that that technology will produce. So that's kind of a complicated answer, but uh, it, it's not this, that, I mean, the, the, the load has got to match the supply exactly. And so these contracts um, or these, these uh, situations between buyer and seller have to be balanced so that you can do that. But again, if a contract with a, uh, with a renewable supplier, wind or solar, uh, it, that is generally as available, then the buyer of that contract would have to make room for that, that additional generation. And they would, they would likely do that. I mean, they were contracted to do it for one thing, but they would likely do it because it, the price is probably less than it is for uh, them to, to generate their own, their own power. But even if it isn't, if they're contractually obligated to do it, they may have to back down gas or back down nuclear, not probably not nuclear, or back down coal to make room for that additional that additional wind. But it wouldn't All right, go we have time for one. We have one more quick question, Ron, and then we'll be at okay. the end of our time. Uh, okay. Now that CREZ is complete, how much free capacity does it have available after accounting for the interconnection agreements that are already in the queue, and when will there need to be a CREZ 2? Well, uh, I, you know, I, I can't answer that exactly. Uh, there's certainly still a lot of of, uh, of new uh, of CREZ capacity available, and it will be, vary from place to place depending on where the new wind is being built. And as I said, I think I mentioned in answer to another question, there's a lot of wind being built up in the panhandle. So those CREZ lines up there are probably uh, loaded or, or have the potential to be loaded closer to their potential than some of the ones farther uh, farther south. Now that uh, that's just uh, that's just a view uh, on my part. I, I think we've got some room before we have to build new Cres lines to uh, to um, to accommodate more total wind. But there's no doubt that we will have to build new lines to uh, every year, uh, probably several, probably a couple of billion dollars worth of new lines, maybe that, maybe between one and two billion dollars worth of new lines every year just to accommodate load growth and to accommodate changes, the movement in, 
in uh, the way power is generated. And so that, while it will not be called CRES, it will effectively do the same thing. CRES was just a very large single program to build a bunch of transmission at the same time or around the same time to accommodate all this new West Texas load that was not getting to market before. It's now getting to market. So now they will they will fine tune it, if you will. They will add new lines here and there. Uh, there there has been there continues to be somewhat of a localized congestion problem. That is, there are some individual areas where they may have two wind farms that are competing for a small transmission line, and that will have to be upgraded. So things like that will continue to be. Uh, continue to be built, just won't be called CRES. So again, there's a lot of transmission being built uh, every year uh, anyway, just to make sure the system is reliable and to accommodate chain movement in load, the way load is changing, and uh, to accommodate the way new generation is being integrated into the system. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's all the time we have for today. Ron, if you have any parting comments to share. Well, I appreciate uh, appreciate the opportunity to do this. I love to talk about ERCOT. I spend a lot of my time uh, musing and, and watching what's going on, and it's a very interesting market. Uh, you know, uh, some I've heard some say that well, you know, this is a fairly limited type of uh, of a um, of a, a conversation because it just addresses ERCOT. But remember, ERCOT is uh, the largest. Uh, renewable generator in the uh, in the United States, more than twice the sec the, the the next largest. Uh, it has uh, a, the, one of the largest growth rates, if not the largest growth rate in terms of new electric demand, and it has uh, it has uh, a t terrific. Uh, a terrific economic future and very, very outstanding solar PV and wind potential. And so it's a great market to talk about. If we had to talk about the whole United States, we'd still spend a lot of it talking about specifically about Texas because this is really uh, the, the center point for a lot of those, a lot of those issues. But I appreciate Principal Solar allowing me to do this. I appreciate all of the and, and Principal Solar Institute for sponsoring this. I appreciate Rick, and I appreciate all of you for listening to me uh, carry on for the last hour or so. So thank you very.